Good morning. Welcome to this session about uh, tutorial about uh, Linux memory management and in relation to that containers. Um, my name is Gerlof Langeveld. I'm a senior trainer for AT Computing, which is a company in the Netherlands uh, supplying all kind of open source training about Linux itself and uh, Kubernetes, Docker and all kind of other uh, subjects. Um, I'm also the creator and maintainer of ATOP, which is a performance monitor, which you will find in the repositories of most Linux distributions as well. And I will use uh, ATOP so now and then during this session to, uh, to demonstrate uh, what we are talking about at that moment. Well, we have uh, a one and a half hour session, and uh, part of this session, the first part, is uh, about memory management in general in Linux. Uh, we will have a look at uh, what are the memory consumers uh, of your ROM memory. <clears throat> and then we talk about uh, kernel and slab caches. Uh, we will see uh, processes as consumers of memory, uh, tempfs, page cache. Uh, we will see about demand paging, how are processes loaded into memory at the moment that you start a new process. Uh, and we will see what happens if memory gets too full. Yeah, then we get page scanning, we get swapping, and in relation to swapping, uh, we also have a parameter which is, uh, well, uh, swappiness uh, that will be uh, handled as well. Um, if memory gets full and swap gets full, um, well, then we get memory stress and then we get the out of memory killing mechanism and we will see uh, the details about that as well. So the first part is about memory management in general, not related to containers yet. And um, we will start in a simplified way in the first slides, and later on we will go more into the details of memory management. After that, uh, we will have a look at um, how can we guarantee memory for processes, uh, and how can we limit the memory use of processes. And there we will have a look at uh, C groups uh, version 2. And that is also used by container implementations. So we will also see the relation with containers uh, in the last part of this talk. Um, there is a memory exercise, exerciser, which is called USEMEM, which is a small program that I made myself also for the performance analysis uh, training. And uh, you can clone it with uh, Git, uh, this repository. And there you will find the source code, which is uh, written in C, usemem.c. Uh, you can uh, you find a make file. You can, if you have a C compiler on your uh, own system, you can uh, generate the executable yourself uh, to do some experiments, maybe, during the talk. Um, there is also a statically linked version of usemem in that repository. So if you don't have a, a compiler yourself on your system, then you might use the uh, static version, which is called usemems instead of usemem, uh, which is the, the normal name. So um, I think the static version still has to be made executable, but after that you can run it. Uh, be careful with this program, because if you really are going to allocate huge parts of memory uh, in one go, uh, you might disturb the, the system you are working on. Um, I will show you this uh, usemem uh, program. Uh, if you run it without parameters, then you <clears throat> will see its usage. Um, with usemem, the only mandatory parameter is that you can specify a virtual size of memory to be created. And by default, it will be created via the, the famous malloc system call, uh, library call, I should say. Um, but you can also specify a physical size optionally. And the physical size means that the memory that you have allocated will also be touched. It will be written to. And that also usually creates that memory physically. Yeah? Not, virtually is, uh, is not enough in that case. Um, Instead of using malloc, you can also create memory mapped um, allocations. Uh, you can also create shared memory uh, with the uh, capital S, for instance, System 5 shared memory or POSIX shared memory. Um, and there are a lot of other flags uh, that you can use uh, to use all kind of kernel features related to allocating memory from processes. But we won't use these special features. 
Uh, there's one parameter that I want to emphasize as well, and that's the minus R parameter. And there you can specify a repetition uh, interval in a number of seconds. And then this memory that you specify will every so many seconds be uh, allocated more. Yeah, so you can simulate uh, a memory leak uh, by that uh, memory leaking uh, process. So this is about the use mem program that I will use for now and then for demonstrations. Okay, let's first have a look at the simplified um, explanation about memory management. Uh, when you boot your Linux system, uh, the kernel will be loaded, and uh, that will be the static part of the kernel. And that's the, the famous file slash boot slash VM Linux with a certain ver version number behind it. Uh, that Linux refers to the fact that it's compressed, and during boot it will be decompressed and it will be stored in memory. But that's only the static part of the kernel. Uh, whenever the kernel is going to allocate data, suppose that later on you start a process, some process administration has to be allocated. If that process opens a file, some file administration has to be allocated in the kernel. So the kernel is also going to create more dynamic um, data. And that will be created via the so-called uh, slab. Yeah, and the slab, ca slab uh, contains, of, uh, contains slab caches for all kind of uh, sizes of data structures that the kernel wants to allocate. So the kernel also grows dynamically. And it, it, it grows, and at a certain moment it can deallocate these, these uh, structures again, and it will shrink again. So this, this slab cache will not be stable, that will uh, expand and, and shrink all the time. But everything which is related to the kernel uh, is memory resident. Yeah? Parts of the kernel will not be swapped out. Well, during the boot phase, at the end of the boot phase, process one will be created, the very first process. And this process is the uh, initial process that we know as system D nowadays. And that will, via its, uh, its unit files, uh, create daemon processes. Yeah? And also the SSH daemon and all, all kind of other processes will be created. So uh, system D is the ancestor of all the user processes. Not of the kernel processes, they will be created by process two usually, uh, but uh, the ancestor of all the user processes. Uh, also, yeah, the interactive shell that we run later on. And of course, um, the executable file uh, will be used to load such a process in memory. We will see more about that in detail later on. Suppose that your system is up and running, then it might be that your processes are running, but there's still a lump of free memory, uh, which is really unused. Well, that unused memory will be used um, in a useful way by creating uh, a cache of that memory. Yeah, and that means that all kind of data which is read and written to the file system, uh, all that data will be kept as much as possible in memory since uh, yeah, disk devices are usually relatively slow and memory is relatively fast. So all the data that we can keep in memory from the file system, uh, we will use that free uh, memory for yeah, as a so-called page cache. Uh, of course, if I start more processes, then that page cache has to shrink again. And if processes will exit or release memory, then the page cache can be uh, expanded again. Yeah, that will happen dynamically. What you can see in this picture is that there's still a lump of memory really free. And that's uh, yeah, a kind of a stock of memory that can be used whenever you start a new process. Yeah, we can immediately uh, give that memory to the process, or when existing processes will expand by malloking or creating shared memory, uh, then that free memory can be used as well. So let's have a look at um, how that looks like on the system. Um, what I will do is that I will run ATOP. Uh, ATOP by default will run with intervals of 10 seconds. Well, for demonstration purposes, it's, it's better to, to shrink the interval a bit to, let's say, four seconds. 
And what we will see here in ATOP is our uh, CPU uh, usage here. Uh, all the CPUs, but also the individual CPUs where, where we look at the CPU in lowercase characters. But we will also see memory information. And usually, if my um, system is connected to uh, a network, I will also see network activity. I will see uh, the activity of my disks, as you can see at this moment, if I... Uh, oh, I was a bit too late. So, um, but what is important at this moment is, of course, uh, what about memory, yeah, about this line. And that similar information some of it that you can also see with, uh, with top or with other uh, commands like uh, free and so on. So what we see here is that my laptop has about uh, a bit less than 16 gigabytes, from which still 13 gigabytes is, is entirely free. But here I can also see the page cache size, which is about half a gigabyte at this moment, because apparently not so much disk accesses have been done so far. Not so many disk accesses. Um, what we can see as well here is the slab. Yeah, so we also can see what is the dynamic memory uh, used by the kernel at this moment. So uh, let's have a look at this page cache. It's, it's only uh, half a gig at this moment. And what I can do now is that I can start uh, a program, uh, just grab, and uh, most of my example uh, command lines, I put in a make file, which is, by the way, also in the git repository that you have in the subdirectory demo, if you are interested in that. But uh, what I want to do is this command, grab minus R, yeah, recursive, some pattern, doesn't matter, in my downloads directory, where I have a lot of files at this moment. Once I start this command, I didn't do it yet, uh, once I start this command, then a lot of file data is read, and that will be stored in the page cache. So I will see that my page cache will uh, expand by that. So I started the command, and if I have a look here, then I can see the page cache was a half uh, gigabyte, and it's in the meantime three gigabytes, and it's in the meantime four and a half gigabytes, uh, six gigabytes. And you can see in the meantime that also my disks are uh, very busy, or my one disk, uh, on which I have the uh, download uh, uh, subdirectory. Yeah, so in the end, uh, it seems that my cache has grown to 10 gigabytes, yeah, what we see here. And it looks uh, stable now, so that means probably that uh, grab is uh, finished in the meantime. But let's also have a look at the slab. Uh, the slab is uh, about 150 megabytes at this moment. And it hasn't grown because of the grab, because grab opens one inode or maybe two inodes, or there are only a couple of huge files in my download directory. But for the rest, uh, grab is reading data. Yeah, and that's filling my page cache, not the slab. But if you access a lot of inodes, yeah, if you open a lot of single files, uh, every uh, inode will be kept in the slab uh, by the kernel. Even if you close the file again, you never know if the file is opened in the near future again. So the kernel tries to keep such an inode in the slab cache. So if I go back uh, to my other window, uh, what I can do is here make find. And that will run the find command. Yeah, finding uh, from the root directory all kind of files in my file system with a modification time of zero days. Well, that will access uh, and, and open a lot of inodes. And what we can see here is that the slab cache, which was 150 megabytes, is now increasing and uh, the kernel is uh, allocating all kind of additional data. But still, uh, we have some memory free uh, here, as we can see. Um, probably, if I access more file data, the page cache can still uh, expand, because we don't need that much free memory. OK, so we have a page cache. Suppose now that more processes are started, and processes like process 4 is expanding, then of course the page cache has to shrink again. 
and uh, the page cache will shrink at a certain moment to a certain minimal value. And if the page cache is, uh, is minimal, uh, then processes have to be uh, removed or parts of processes have to be removed from memory uh, yeah, to get free memory again. Yeah, uh, it's, it's all about this, uh, this free memory here at the bottom. Uh, if it really uh, is used by new processes, then it has to be uh, filled again, that free memory. And if the page cache cannot deliver uh, more uh, memory again, then uh, we have to take memory from processes that are currently running. Yeah, and then the swaps comes into pace. So parts of processes will be written to the swap device. And uh, at a certain moment, we can reach the situation that swap is full as well. And then we have a problem, because then we might get a certain deadlock. Uh, memory is full. We want to get rid of a, a part of a process, but swap is full as well. Uh, we can get free swap to get parts of processes back into memory, but that's not possible. Memory is full, and so on. So then we get the famous uh, own killing, which means out of memory killing. Then the kernel on its own initiative will kill uh, one of the processes. And we will see more details about that later on during this talk. So if we have a look um, at what parts uh, what components use physical memory in our RAM. Uh, we have seen the kernel, the start static part of the kernel. We have seen the slab caches, the slab. Uh, we have also seen the size of the slab. Uh, but also processes, of course, use memory at a certain moment. Well, what we can see here on this slide is that Atop, in its newest version, uh, also has a kind of pseudo-graphical uh, representation of the most um, most important hardware resources like the processors, the busy uh, time of the processors. Uh, we can see here the activity on disk. We can see the activity on the network interfaces, how many packets are going in and out. Uh, but we can also see memory here, uh, more or less pseudographically represented. Uh, this is, by the way, new in Atop 2.9, which is not in all the distributions yet. Uh, I think that our um, EPEL doesn't have it yet, but most other distributions have it. Uh, you can start for this uh, representation out of with the minus B flag, capital B, but you can also use the minus the uh, capital B uh, key inside uh, Atop itself. So if I press the B while Atop is running, uh, I can see that this is the situation at the moment. Uh, we have uh, the processes and the kernel all together. Uh, we have the slab. Uh, I'll come back to TempFS. We have the page cache, and we have still three gigabytes, as we saw earlier, uh, free. And I can see my swap device, which is uh, about eight gigabytes, which is still entirely free. Yeah. So what kind of consumers can we have, and can we see in memory? And and on swap. Well, we already discussed about kernel and processes. Uh, another consumer of memory is tempfs. Um, if I have a look here, then I can see that there are various file systems uh, that are based on tempfs. And tempfs means that it doesn't consume any uh, space on disk. Um, such a uh, file system is entirely kept in memory. And if memory gets too full, it will even be swapped out. Yeah, and tempfs is a yeah, uh, non-persistent uh, 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 file system in that sense. And we can see that one of the file systems is slash dev slash shm, uh, which is a tempfs-based file system. Uh, you can see the maximum size of such a file system is usually half of memory. Yeah, remember my memory was about 15.2 uh, gigabytes, and uh, half of memory is, is really the, the size of a tempfs by default. You can uh, limit that, but that's the default, as you can see. Uh, and that also means that if I write a lot of data to that file system, that, uh, that might even introduce swapping in, in my uh, uh, system. So what I can do here, is that I do a make of uh, a command again, and that will be the command dd, 
um, I will put it at the, at the top of my screen. Uh, I will do a DD and copy a file, um, slash dev slash zero, to slash dev slash shm slash big, uh, and I will create a file of four gigabytes here. Yeah. So when running this command, uh, I can, uh, it's, it's finished already, I can see now that tempfs is really uh, consuming a lot of space in, in raw memory. And it has caused that uh, the page cache from which it is in fact part uh, has uh, shrunk. Okay, another consumer of memory is shared memory. And shared memory in fact belongs to processes. Uh, shared memory is a way that it can be created by a process and it can be shared by other processes. So sh a, a lump of shared memory can be part of several processes in a read-write fashion, uh, one of the processes can modify things and the other processes connected to that same piece of shared memory can, can use that information or even modify it uh, themselves. So um, shared memory, uh, we, we know that in two flavors, uh, system five shared memory, which has other system calls to, to create it. And we have POSIX shared memory, which is in fact based on TempFS again. Uh, so I will have a look at System 5 shared memory, which is, uh, I think, most often used. And I can create, via my useMem command, uh, a lump of shared memory uh, as well. So having a look at my command line again, uh, I can do a useMem minus capital S, that is uh, System 5 shared memory, and I can create a lump of shared memory of four gigabytes. Yeah, that's virtually. Uh, that will not create it really in memory, but I can also take care that it is written to, and by writing to that memory, it will really be created in memory. And I will run this in the background. I will create this in the background. So going back to my other window, I can see that uh, also shared memory has been, uh, uh, takes uh, a part of my memory now. There's still no swapping going on, but all the time the page cache has, has shrunk, yeah, making space for my new uh, memory allocations. Okay, what I can do next is that I can also create some, some other pieces of memory, uh, and that's what I can do with a normal malloc. So I can do a use mem, let's create five gigabytes uh, and also create it physically, yeah, fill it with data. And I can run such a process in the background and see what happens here in memory. Yeah, and what you can see now is that uh, memory fills up, uh, page cache has shrunk to a minimum. Uh, still, there is uh, no swapping going on. Uh, by the way, what you see here in uh, ATOP is apart from the memory consumption and the swap consumption, you can also see events. And there you can see if page scanning and swapping out is going on. And these are colored green, which means it's, it's okay. Uh, and you can even see if own kills have uh, taken place. But we are on the edge of filling our memory no swapping yet, and what I can do is that I run the last command, that I run that last command again, yeah, creating another five gigabytes of memory, and then we will see that we reach a point that uh, swapping is, uh, is going on, and uh, all kind of uh, uh, yeah, data is uh, moved to the swap space. Yeah? So that can be processes that are moved to swap space or parts of processes, and that can be uh, tempfs and shared memory uh, as well. So if I create another process of five gigabytes, then uh, I'm really uh, getting at a critical point uh, because I don't have that many uh, space left in, uh, that much space left in, in swap. Yeah, so you can see that all kind of things are coloring red now. And you can also see that, uh, well, you, I missed it, uh, unfortunately, because of a very small interval of four seconds. But you can see um, uh, own kills was uh, also red, and it says, well, 
one of the, one of the processes has been own killed. You can see after own killing has uh, passed, then that block remains uh, a while uh, orange, uh, even if you have missed that event, which is of course a very terrible event. Uh, then you can still see uh, that uh, own killing has taken place yeah, recently. You can also see that uh, shared memory is swapped out uh, apart from processes. And in this part of the processes, the black part, there you can also see that TEMPFS is swapped out. It's not in memory anymore. We have a lot of, uh, well, some free memory again. Uh, page cache is eliminated uh, almost uh, entirely. And we have still some shared memory uh, left in memory. Okay, what I want to do now is that I'm going to kill all the use man processes. Yeah, one of them has been killed, as you have seen. Uh, killed, that was the own killed one. Uh, and it has been killed by uh, a signal nine, a sick kill uh, by the kernel. Yeah. Uh, but I will also kill the others, which makes my memory rather clean again. Yeah, not entirely, still processes might be swapped out, uh, parts of processes, and still TEMPFS might be swapped out. Well, in fact, TEMPFS is swapped out. Uh, what I can do here is that I do a make um, of this command. Uh, I do a cat of my big file in, in uh, TEMPFS again, uh, and that will my TEMPFS uh, uh, be swapped, uh, take care that my tempfs will be swapped in again. So if I run this command, then we can see that tempfs is uh, slightly filling, and you can see that the space on the swap device is slightly uh, decreasing. until uh, it stabilizes, but uh, it's still uh, busy. Uh, and you can see also my reads on disk uh, are still going on, reads uh, from the swap device. All right. Let's have a look at the slides again. So what we have seen now is a simplified view of memory management. Uh, we will dive into a, more, a bit more details now. Um, as we have seen in the simplified view, it looked like all the processes are loaded as one lump into memory, yeah, which is not the case in practice. Uh, if we have a look at our RAM memory, it is subdivided in equally sized chunks. And these chunks are called pages. And uh, the page size is in principle defined by the hardware, by the CPU and the MMU. Uh, and uh, of course, it's, it's important to know what the page size is because a lot of uh, memory consumption is reported in all kinds of counters as the number of pages. And to know how much gigabytes or megabytes that is, it's good to know the page size. Well, you can figure out the page size of your system with the command getconf page size and there uh, you will see the page size which is well most often 4k yeah uh, specifically for amd and uh, intel uh, uh, processors so we have 4k pages let's assume there are other architectures that have for instance 16k pages but let's assume 4k pages uh, a simple command like ps already reports certain things in page size uh, uh, counters. So PS minus L shows you a value called SZ, and that's the virtual size of a process. But with the Y flag, you also got, got the uh, resident uh, size. I'll come back to a virtual size and res resident size more uh, in, in uh, the rest of my talk. But for now, uh, you can see two values here that are related to memory sizes, virtual and resident size. Uh, one of them is by default in kilobytes, and the other one is by default in pages, in the same line. It's always a bit strange to me, but um, the, the RSS, the resident size, is in kilobytes, and this one is in pages, so it has to be multiplied by four. 
yeah, to get uh, kilobytes as well. So beware that you are knowing the, uh, the page size. So the picture that we saw before with all the running processes with different colors, uh, we can see that same picture again if we look here. Uh, then we can see that um, all the, the processes that are running are using single pages and they don't have to, to be contiguous. Uh, you can see all kind of uh, yellow pa uh, well, green pages and, and uh, orange pages and so on from different processes that are mixed up in memory and uh, a process consists of various single pages. Yeah. Um, here you can see again uh, pages that are marked with an S that are slap, ca page, slap cache pages. Uh, belonging to the kernel, you can see the, the pages marked with a C that are page cache pages uh, belonging to the page cache. You can see the yellow pages which are free uh, with the F inside and all the other ones that don't have a character are process pages. And in that way we can also consider the swap space as a collection of pages on disk yeah, that have been swapped out uh, so far. Um, a swap space is not a file system. A swap space, yeah, you, you uh, uh, format that with the mkswap command, and that's just formatted as a collection of pages that are swapped out. Um, you can also see the executable file can also be considered as a collection of pages. And there we can see uh, various pages that are code pages, uh, containing the instructions to be executed, and various pages will be data pages containing the uh, static variables of the, the process. Yeah, and um, we will see how such a program is loaded uh, after all. So if we have a look at loading a program, and for those of you who are familiar with the system calls, that's in fact the exec system call, not the fork system call, but the exec system call, then a new executable is loaded into the process. And such a process starts at that moment then uh, with an uh, empty uh, uh, set of pages. Yeah, there are no pages loaded at the moment that you start a new program. Uh, the only thing which will be done by the kernel is that it sets up the page tables for the process the page tables that are used by the MMU, yeah, the memory management unit, which is integrated in the CPU, so we are talking about hardware, and the MMU has to know where can I find the physical pages of a certain process, and the MMU will know by having a set of page tables. Well, those page tables are all marked for the uh, MMU as these pages are not present, so no pages are present uh, for the MMU at the moment that you start a new program. Well, then the process is started and it will refer to the address of the first instruction in a code page. But that code page is not present in memory. And then the MMU, the hardware, will give a trap, yeah, a page fault trap that says, hey, uh, you are referring to a non-existing page. And then the kernel reacts on that trap by finding a free page in memory and loading that specific uh, page, yes, assume a code page here, uh, loading that specific page in that free page. And that's not free page anymore, of course, afterwards. And then it will set up the, the page table entry for the MMU. It will say that the page exists now, and it will also make a reference to that physical location of that page. And then the process will be restarted and will retry to do the access to that page. And now it will succeed. Well, suppose that in the first instruction that will be executed now, uh, you refer to a static variable in a data page, then again, uh, that reference to that address will introduce a page fault trap by the MMU, and the kernel will take that specific data uh, page from the executable, will find a free page in memory, and loads it in that free page, and sets up the, the page table entry again. Yeah, and this is what we call load on demand or demand paging. Uh, when you start a new program, only those pages will be loaded into memory that are really referenced by the process. And pages that are not referenced for this run uh, will stay on disk. They will never uh, be loaded into memory. And that is the difference between the virtual size of a process and the resident size of a process. The virtual size of a process is the worst case size. Suppose that you would touch every page 
in your executable. And also, you would touch every page in the malloced areas and in shared memory and so on, then your process can be this big uh, as the virtual size. But in practice, you won't touch all the pages during every run of your application. So in, uh, usually the residence size of a process is smaller than the virtual size of the process. Yeah, so that's in fact what we see uh, with the command ps minus ly. There we can see the resident size and if we look at bash here, my shell, I can see that uh, uh, multiplied by four that my virtual size of the shell is 220 megabytes, worst case, but it in fact only uses six megabytes of resident memory. Yeah, and that's important. What is the resident use of your processes? in memory and not the virtual use. Yeah, and of course, this kind of counters you can also see in top as V size and R size and, and, and A top and so on. Uh, per process, you can see what is the, the real resident size and virtual size. So if we have a look at a process, yeah, a process always consists of code of course, uh, instructions to be executed. And uh, the code pages are shareable. If I start twice the same, same program or 10 times the same program, the same executable, then the kernel will notice that and it will only load the code pages once and they will be shared by all the processes. So if 10 users at the same time uh, run the Vim command, uh, the Vim program, the code pages of Vim are only once in memory. But per process, you will get your own data pages because they are modifiable, of course, and your own stack pages. Uh, and you will get your own heap pages, yeah, which is in fact the size which is uh, created by malloc, doing malloc in your program. So that are mandatory pages that we see always for every process. But a process optionally can also use shared libraries. Yeah, and the idea of a shared library is, um, suppose that you have two executable files, two different executable files, of course, uh, they will not share the code, yeah? two different files. But still, parts of the code might be the same. Um, every executable uses C functions and needs the, the C library uh, uh, routines. So what you can do is that you get these uh, code that they have in common, that you get it out of the normal executables and create a new executable file, which is called the shared library. And then you can uh, take care that these executables are referring to the path name in the file system of this shared library, where we have shareable code yeah, and corresponding data, which is needed by that code. So one of the executables now can be Vim and the other one can be Nano. Uh, so even if people are using Vim and somebody else is using Nano, still they can use the same shared library and still they can have data of a, co a code in common yeah, from that shared library. Um, this code will be once in memory of the shared library. The corresponding data will be per process, of course, because every process makes its own modifications again. Well, furthermore, a process can create shared memory. We talked about that earlier for inter-process communication purposes. And a process can use memory mapped files. Yeah, um, it's a bit out of scope, but just in short, um, you, can enter, you can access a file in the conventional way by opening a file with the open call and after that do read and write system calls. But instead, you can also open a file with the open call and then do a memory map to put the data of the file in your address space of your process. And memory map returns the start address of that mapped data. And then you can simply modify and look at your data in the file by uh, address manipulations. Yeah, and well, that's the idea of uh, memory mapped files, which are also part of process space uh, optionally. So what we have seen is that we have 
a virtual size for a process. And the virtual process, the, pro, the virtual process size is the worst case size, as I mentioned. Yes. Uh, that can be the resident size if the process uh, touches every page. Uh, but the resident set size, yeah, that's only what is at this moment in memory of the process. Yeah. Notice that both sizes include the shared pages. Yeah, all the shared pages, again. So you cannot simply say, I add all the resident sizes of my processes together, and then I know what my processes consume. Yeah, because you will have too much. Uh, for every process, all the, the shared pages are calculated in the resident size. And that's why there's also a third um, size of a process, which is called the proportional set size. And that's rather similar to the resident size. However, um, the shared pages are divided by the number of sharing processes. And, well, then you get, if you add all the process consumptions together, then you get a more realistic view about uh, yeah, what is all the space consumed in memory by the processes. Uh, that um, proportional set size is, for instance, shown by ATOP. And if we go here, uh, the problem is, however, I can switch back with the capital B to, to text mode again and see all the uh, details. Uh, I can also press the M button uh, for memory, and then I see all the memory um, details about my processes. And here you can see the here you can see the uh, virtual size and the resident size. Of course, the resident size is always smaller than the virtual size, but you can also see the proportional size. Well, the proportional size is not filled at the moment because it's uh, a lot of work and a lot of CPU consumption by ATOP to calculate that proportional size. So uh, it will only do that if you press the capital R key in ATOP, then it will calculate this, which you can also give as a flag. But there's another issue. This can only be calculated if you run with uh, privileges, root privileges, So, which I didn't do. So I will start ATOP again uh, with uh, sudo to run it uh, in a privileged way. And um, here I can start, I also press the, uh, the R key, capital R. And then you can see if I press the M again for the memory details, then I can see also the proportional set size. Yeah. So in fact, proportional set size is always smaller than the resident size, and the resident size is always smaller than the virtual size. All right, let's have a look what happens if memory gets too full. Yeah, we have seen that in the simplified version, if memory gets too full, then uh, first of all, yeah, the page cache has to shrink, but also we want to get rid of pages of, of processes and swap them out. So how does that really work under the hood? Well. If we have a look at physical memory of your system, uh, then we can see that physical memory is subdivided in so-called nodes. If you have a simple laptop or just a small system, then probably you don't use NUMA. Uh, that means that you just have one lump of memory, uh, one node. But if you look at, at larger systems, uh, you will probably have multiple nodes. Uh, you will probably use NUMA, uh, non-uniform memory architecture, which means that the total uh, memory size is subdivided in various physical pages, uh, various uh, physical chunks. So here we see an, an, an example of, um, a simplified example of a NUMA system with two nodes. And part of my memory is on node 0, and part of my memory is on node 1. Uh, both nodes together, that's the total space, uh, memory space of this system. You can see in a node, to a node, we also have various CPUs connected. And the other node as well in the system has various CPUs connected. Uh, these C CPUs can very fast access the memory in the same node. 
but they even can access memory in the other node, but that will be done via an internet connect, which is, well, uh, slow. Uh, it's a slower way and with a higher lat latency uh, than accessing the memory in your own node, but it is possible to access memory in other nodes. Well, so memory is subdivided in nodes, and nodes are subdivided in zones, again, for Linux memory management. And what we see here is that the first zone in memory, that's the so-called DMA zone. And that's the first 60 megabytes of memory. Um, and that is still, well, rather precious memory if you are still using Isaac controllers. Uh, Isaac controllers can only address, 20, uh, only have 24 uh, bits to address, and they can only do DMA, uh, direct memory access, um, by in the first 60 megabytes of physical memory. Yeah, so that's precious memory, and that's a separate zone. Then we have another zone, which is the DMA32 zone, and that is from the 16 megabytes to 4 gigabytes. Yeah, which is addressable by 32 bits uh, for 32 bit controllers that might do DMA. They have to, to have their uh, buffers there. Uh, and the rest um, of your memory is, in fact, normal zone. And that's also what we can see here. We have in the first node the DMA zone, the DMA32 zone. Uh, the rest of the first node is normal zone, and also the other node is normal zone entirely. So, if we have a look at that free memory, which is always kept free, uh, even if the page cache expands all the time, uh, that free memory is configurable. And that is defined by the kernel parameter proxys vm min free k bytes. And the default value of that is determined by yeah, the, the total memory that you have in your system, so that will be defined during the boot phase by the kernel itself. But you can overwrite this file if you want to have uh, a stock of more free memory uh, or less free memory or, or whatever. Well, per zone, per zone uh, three threshold values are defined. And first of all, the min threshold value is defined. And the min threshold value per zone is a proportional uh, part for this zone of that min free k bytes. Let's have a look at uh, an example on the next slide. Um, watch this file, proc zone info. Um, of course, via such a file, we can look into the kernel administration. And in that kernel administration, we can really see these uh, three threshold values. So let's first have a look at part of the next slide. Uh, if I do a grab of a couple of uh, terms in proc zone info, I don't need all the other things there, but only these things. What I can see here is the DMA zone. I can see the DMA32 zone, and I can see the normal zone. By the way, this is a normal laptop with 32 gigabytes of memory. And, um, well, it only has uh, these three zones. And you can see all the zones are in node zero. Yeah, that's mentioned here. Well, if we look at spanned for all the three zones, that's the size of the zone. Yeah, so let's say 4,096, uh, sorry, uh, times four. Yeah, that's 16 megabytes. That's the first zone. Uh, this number of pages here is, if you calculate this times 4K, it's 4 gigabytes minus 16 megabytes. Yeah? And this is uh, uh, the rest of the pages uh, for span for the normal zone, yeah? up to 32 uh, gigabyte. Well, you can also see per zone how many pages are free. Uh, pages free are maintained per zone. And if you use the free command, or top or a top, and you see the free memory, uh, at that moment, all these free uh, sizes per zone are added together, and that is given to you as the free memory in the entire system. But it's maintained per zone. Well, what you can see here is that first threshold value that I meant. Um, how many pages, uh, proportionally, are to be delivered free 
for the DMA zone, uh, and how many by the DMA32 zone, and how many by the normal zone. If you add all these pages together from, from the min, and we can see that here, then we come to 16,895 pages, yeah, times four, and that is really uh, the number of uh, min-free k-bytes which has been uh, uh, configured here. Yeah, so uh, that has to be proportionally uh, delivered by the three zones. So that's the min value, but we can also to see per zone two other values which are low and high. Well, they are also calculated at boot time. Low is the min value of the zone plus a certain factor times min, and that factor is usually around a half. Uh, and you can see that high is that factor times min times two. So let's have a look again here. Uh, min is eight for the DMA zone. About half more is low, and uh, about half more, uh, the factor is here dot 47, so it's not really 50% more. Um, we can see uh, that these other thresholds are also calculated. Yeah. Um, also here, we can see the same, and also here we can see the same about low is twice uh, min, and uh, high is uh, No, sorry, low is 50% more than min and uh, high is uh, about twice min. Okay, going back here, these thresholds are important to know when we are going to, to fill up the free pages. Suppose that the free pages in the zone at this moment are still, well, high, a lot of free pages in this zone. At a certain moment, the pages in the zone are going to be used. Yeah, by the page cache or by the process, and then we see that the free pages in the zone will drop. Well, if the free pages in the zone reach the low value of the zone, then there is a process in the kernel which is called kswapd that will be activated, and that will take care that occupied pages in the zone will become free pages again. Yeah, and it will not just release one page, yeah, when we just drop uh, below this value, then we got uh, a trashing, as it is called. Uh, but it will also immediately yeah, um, release a lot of pages and make them free again, up to uh, the moment that we reach the high value again of the zone. Then it stops releasing pages. Then we have enough free pages again. Of course, these free pages will be used again in time, and we will reach again, uh, we, the number of pages drops, the free pages drop below low, and then the case swap D will take care that pages will be released again, yeah, so that we reach the high value again in the zone. Yeah. So that might also be exp uh, explained that you sometimes see heavy swapping while the free memory on system level is still a lot. But it might be that one of the zones has uh, a shortage of free uh, pages, and that's why swapping goes on in that zone specifically, and not probably in other zones. Excuse me? Yeah. Um, how it is decided by the operating system what process by what zone, and the process itself um, is. Um, Will be swapped. Well, the kernel tries to preserve the, the pages in the sixth in the in the DMA uh, in the first two, uh, in principle. But well, uh, they will be rather equally uh, spread. Uh, yeah, but pages in the first two zones are are more precious. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So that's the moment that the system starts freeing up uh, pages again. Yeah, get uh, these pages free. Well, how the system will do that, we will see on the next slide, but first have, uh, go back to this slide. Um, we see here all the physical pages yeah, in the notes, and of course, the kernel has a small piece of administration for each physical page. 
Yeah, that says if the page is, is free at this moment or is it in use. Uh, for what is it in use? What page can we find from what process and so on? So for every physical page, the kernel maintains a small piece of administration. Well, if we have a look here, uh, then we can see that these pieces of administration of every physical page is in a certain list. And let's first have a look at the left part of this picture. What we see in the left part are the so-called anonymous pages. And, well, anonymous pages that are more or less the pages of processes, yeah, the data pages and the stack pages of processes, but also shared memory pages, also tempfs pages, they are all here in the left part of this, this picture. Well, suppose that you are going to start a new process, then that new process uh, needs free pages. They are taken from this collection of free pages, and these pages are filled, yeah, as we have seen, by, by referring to those pages. And when such a page is filled, it will be put in this list, and that's the active anon anonymous pages list. And this is a so-called LRU list, recently used list. Uh, it will be put at the top of that list, but suppose that later processes are also using pages, then my earlier process, the pages of that, will uh, s slightly travel to the bottom of this page list, yeah, to the bottom of this uh, active list. Well, if it's at the bottom, then it might be transferred to the inactive anonymous page list. And that are pages from which we think that they are probably not in use anymore by the process. The process is still running, but this page might not be in use anymore and might be a future candidate to be swapped out yeah, if it's not used. Well, and also this is a LRU list, and also there it will slightly go down and travel down in time. Uh, but suppose that that page is touched by the process, then at the bottom of this list, before releasing the page, we will notice that the page has been used again by the process, and then it will uh, be moved to this active list again and will be put on top so that it has some time again to travel to the bottom of this list and go to the inactive list. And, well, if it's referenced again, it will take that cycle. But if it hasn't been uh, used, such a page, for a while by the process, then it can be released as a free page. So what we see at the right part are the pages that more or less belong to the uh, page cache, yeah, the blue pages that are uh, these pages belonging to the page cache. And also for the page cache, we have an active file pages list and inactive file pages li uh, list. Well, suppose that one of the processes opens a file and reads some data from the file. Um, of course, in the page cache, you only want to keep the popular data that are data blocks that are accessed, well, more frequently, frequently and seems to be popular. So at the moment that I touch uh, or read a piece of data from a file for the first time, a free page is taken. That page is filled with the data from the file system, but we don't know if it's a popular page, it, if it will be used in the future, uh, near future again. So first of all, this page will be moved on its first reference to the inactive page list. And that's also an LRU list where it uh, goes down in time. If it hasn't been used and read by another process in that time, then it will be uh, moved to the free pages list again and it doesn't seem to be a popular page. But while traveling down, when it is read again by another process or the same process, then it seems to be popular, and then it will be moved at its second reference to the active file pages list. So in this way, we get the most popular, uh, and we will keep the most popular data pages in the page cache uh, all the time. Well, notice that this is a pool mechanism. Yeah, uh, um, when the number of free pages drops under the low value, as we have seen before, then we need more free pages again, and then we will pull at the inactive anonymous page list and at the inactive file page list to fill up the free pages again in this zone. 
But uh, that will also take care that pages are moved from the active list to the inactive list and at this point as well. Yeah, so this is used to fill up my free pages again in a zone. We have these, these active and inactive lists per zone. But the question is, of course, if I'm running out of free pages in a zone, how many pages will be swapped of processes versus how many pages will be released in the page cache? So that's what we see in the next uh, slide. Uh, in the next slide, we will see that um, what is the, the, the balancing of uh, anonymous pages and uh, page cache pages. Well, that's more or less controlled by the swappiness parameter, uh, proxies VM swappiness, which is a value between 0 and 200. Um, the lower this value, the more aggressive we will take pages from the, uh, the, the page cache uh, and the less swapping we will do from processes. Uh, and the higher this value, of course, then we will swap more process pages and leave the page cache more alone. So if we look at the, the, the code in the kernel that uh, um, decides what, how, how do we get our free pages again, uh, if no swap space is available at all in my system, yeah, there's not even a swap device configured, of course, then we can only shrink the page cache. Yeah, we cannot swap out anything. If swappiness is really zero, then we will also shrink the page cache only if we are needing free pages. If the page cache has a minimal size, then we will only shrink the process pages, then we can't shrink, any, uh, we can't shrink, uh, shrink the, uh, the page cache anymore and we will swap out proce processes, process pages. But, well, these are in fact the first three points are in fact uh, exceptions. Uh, if we look at the normal situation, then we will take some pages from the page uh, cache and some other pages we will take from the processes. Yeah, and we will do swapping. And that is determined by the swappiness parameter. Um, then we get an anonymous priority, which is the swappiness value, which is on most systems by default 60. And the file priority is 200 minus swappiness, which is by default uh, uh, then, in that case, 140. Yeah, so that will be the, the relation, 60 against 140, between how many pages do we get from the processes versus how many pages do we get uh, here from the page cache. Okay, but then finally we can reach the point that memory is full and swap is full. And then, yeah, we have the, the, the situation that we uh, cannot do anything else than kill a process. And that will be done by the kernel, and that's what we call own killing. And the kernel searches for the process with the so-called highest ohm score. Um, and that's, at this moment, it, it has been modified in, in, in time, this mechanism, but at this moment in the modern kernels, you can see that the, the process with the highest memory consumption uh, physically will be killed. Yeah, and this Ohm score is uh, calculated by getting the usage of the process uh, according to real memory usage and swap space yeah, versus the total memory and, and swap space, the per meal value. Add 1000 to that and add an Ohm score adjustment to that uh, to artificially lower or uh, increase the Ohm score of a process. And that's done via this formula that will define for every process the Ohm score and the process with the highest Ohm score at this moment will be killed. Well, we can also see the Ohm score, so we can already predict on beforehand which process will be killed when we are running out of memory. And uh, you can see that under the PROC uh, directory in the PID of a certain process, Ohm score. But you can also modify that Ohm score adjustment, which is in the formula. And that's a, a value which by default mostly is zero, but you can give it a negative value yeah, to make the process more uh, um, protect the process against ohm killing, or you can increase this value to yeah, 
to make this process more a candidate for own killing. So let's have a look. Um, when I do this command, I do a grab on, well, just a beginning of line as, as a search pattern in all the Ohm scores underneath slash proc of all the processes. Uh, of course, I could have done a cat, but cat doesn't show the file name, and I want to know the file name. Yeah, that's what grab shows me. So if I have a look here, then I can see all the Ohm scores of all the processes that are running currently. Uh, and you can see that a lot of them have the value 666. Yeah. And why is that? Well, suppose that the per mil usage of a process is even less than one per mil, then this is zero plus thousand plus an uh, Ohm score of zero, uh, then times two third, this will end up in 666. And so that's a value that you see quite often. Well, if I do this command, uh, I can sort my output of that grab command, and I can sort it on the value which is at the end. So then I can also predict which process will be first candidate to be killed yeah, by own killing. And you can see it's a process uh, 3066, this one. And um, if I have a look here, uh, 3066. Yeah, then I can see that it's, uh, uh, oh, it's my uh, viewer. I didn't expect that, but uh, this is my, uh, <laughs> right. So no home killing anymore. Yeah, so artificially you can um, make your process uh, uh, with the ohm score adjustment, you can give it uh, a higher ohm score or lower ohm score. This is also what you can specify, for instance, in uh, systemd service files. For if you have a very important uh, uh, process to be started, you can already give it an ohm score, a negative ohm score adjustment. All right, so far for the general part of memory management. Um, what I want to have a look at is how does this apply to containers. <clears throat> containers will use C groups, control groups. And C groups is a mechanism to subdivide the capacity of a certain resource, and that can be CPU capacity, that can be memory capacity in this case, um, to subdivide the, the capacity um, and, and make slices of that total capacity and um, then assign certain processes to those slices. Yeah. And uh, what you can do with C groups is that you can put a limitation for all the processes in a certain C group on the memory usage. Yeah. Normally, processes can use all the memory there is and by that introduce swapping also and get other processes out of memory. But you can also say no, uh, processes assigned to this C group can only use maximum uh, 500 megabytes. But you can also take care that a process is not entirely swapped out. Yeah? Uh, you can also have a guarantee on memory consumption and say, well, this is the uh, lower value, uh, the lowest limit, and this is what I want to assign anyhow to a process, to a pro, uh, C group. So C groups are usually managed by system D, and they are implemented via a pseudo file system, yeah, which is similar to slash proc, not a real file system. And you can see that the root directory of this pseudo file system is sysfs C group. And initially, all the processes are in that uh, root C group in this directory, they are all assigned to that C group, and initially that C group has all the capacity. But we can make subdivisions. <clears throat> Let's have a look at an example how we can make subdivisions, uh, how we can make our own C groups. If I go to the C group subdirectory with the CD command, then I can see with LS that there are a lot of files, which are not really files, but pseudo files uh, that I can manipul uh, manipulate and, and look at. 
Uh, and then you can see one of the files is cgroup.prox. And there, if I do a cut on that file, I can see all the PIDs of the processes that are currently assigned to this C group. Yeah. Well, what I can do in this root directory, I can make my own subdirectory yeah, by just doing an mkdir. And if I go to that new subdirectory, it's by magic already filled with all kinds of files again. Also there, I can find the file cgroupprox, which holds the PIDs of all the processes assigned to this C group. But I can also see all kinds of other files uh, that I can use to manipulate the memory usage of all the processes assigned to this C group. Yeah. Um, if I have a look at, in my new C group, which processes are assigned to it, yeah, then I can see that the, the file is empty. And uh, I can also see with memory.current, what is the memory consumption physically at this moment of all the processes in this subgroup. And well, it's zero still. Well, what I can do now is that I assign a PID, that I echo a PID to that cgroup.prox file. And you know, dollar dollar is the PID of my running shell. So I assign my shell PID to this file and make my shell a member of the C group. My shell was a member of the uh, root group, but there it will be taken out if you assign it to another C group underneath. And all the descendants of my shell will inherit the connection to the C group. So from my shell, I start big app now, and that will also be assigned the PID of that automatically to this C group. It's a child of this shell. So if I have a look at memory.current now, what's the current usage, then I can see the, uh, the memory consumption of uh, oh, big app and maybe more, but we'll see that. So that memory.current that you find per C group, uh, that contains the memory consumption of all processes in the C group, but also the memory consumption of these processes uh, in the kernel, yeah? not only the user uh, space itself. So also what these processes have allocated in the page cache and in the slab caches of the kernel. Yeah? Except the memory that a process already claimed before the process was assigned to the C group. Yeah, that is not uh, in memory.current. So if I go back to my example, we see the same example here again. At the moment that I do an echo of the PID of my shell, then the allocation of my shell that has been done before is not in memory.current. Yeah, only the new allocations of the shell from now on will be in memory.current. Uh, memory and if I start my new process, that will also be in uh, memory.current. Entirely. Yeah, you can see that also with PS, you can see uh, always to which C group is my process uh, assigned. And you can see that all these processes are now assigned to the same C group. Okay, with C groups, you can also give uh, processes a guarantee, guaranteed. Uh, uh, number of, of pages to use physically that will not be swapped. By default, processes can be swapped entirely, but I can give a process a certain memory guarantee for important processes. And that's what I can do as follows. If I go to my top directory and I make a new subdirectory again, VIPS, yeah, uh, and then I uh, can find a value there, memory.low, which is uh, the minimum uh, value that I want to guarantee for the processes in this C group. And I can do an echo of, for instance, 500 megabytes to that, memory.low, and by that I have assigned that memory. It will not be immediately allocated, but it means that if I later on start processes in the C group, they will, by demand paging, get their pages, and they might at a certain moment go over 500 megabytes, but they might also be swapped, but never under 500 me megabytes again, yeah, if that is the guarantee. So now I can start my VIP server, which is a very important server, and it gets this PID, uh, 13,000 so-and-so, and I can do an echo of that PID to the cgroup.prox, yeah, and by that I assigned it to this cgroup. However, 
uh, all the memory that has been allocated by my FIP server before doing this echo is not calculated. Yeah, so, therefore, this is a better way that we see at the right side of the slide. First, assign my shell to the C group, and then via my shell, uh, I can uh, start my VIP server, or even do an exec my VIP server to get rid of my shell. So, by that, I can give a guaranteed memory amount to my processes, but I can also set a limitation at the other hand. Yeah, suppose that you have a process with a memory leakage and it cannot be solved for the moment, then you can still say, okay, let's put a maximum memory size on that process or process group and then run that process. And at the moment that it reaches that value, then it will only swap its own pages out and it will not uh, push other processes out of memory, which will by default be the case. And here again, you can see that I create a new subdirectory leakers, and I go to that subdirectory. Uh, you can see that the maximum memory that can be used by all the processes is max, everything there is, but I can put a limitation here, echo 100 megabytes to memory max, and that will take care that, we, uh, that the, the process cannot use more than 100 megabytes of physical memory. Yeah, now I can assign my shell again, to the prox directory, the IP ID of my shell, and I can see uh, my current memory usage, which is only of the shell, of course, at this moment. Uh, you can even see, this is the memory usage, memory.current, uh, how much swap space is used so far. Yeah, no swap space by this C group. Suppose now that I start my leaking application, then I can again look at memory.current and memory.swap current. Well, that increases memory current, memory swap current. If I look at a while later, yeah, then I can see that my uh, memory has reached 100 megabytes and it cannot go over that. And I can see that it's now filling the swap. Even swap space can be limited on a C group by doing an echo of a certain value to memory.swap max. Uh, which means if the process reaches the memory maximum and it will be swapped out and it reaches the memory swap max, then it will be home killed. Yeah. Even if there's plenty memory in the system and plenty swap. Right, which brings us to containers. As we know, containers are isolated ecosystems to run your applications in. And every process running in a container is in fact a native process for the host it runs on. Yeah, that's typically different from uh, virtual machines. Every process running in a system, in a container, is for the host running underneath, it's a native process. So that means every process in a container uh, yeah, will be treated as any other process on the host yeah, by using the page cache and the slab caches and so on. However, every container has its own mini file system, yeah, which is different from the host file system. So that mini file system comes from the image yeah, that has been created by the image and that can be modified by the application uh, as well. And in that mini file system, we will find the executables and the shared libraries and so on for this particular container. Well, you know, at the moment that you start a container based on an image, then there will be an additional layer created on top of the image layers that will hold all the modifications done in the container by the application. So we have a static mini file system from the image and on top of that we have a layer that holds all the modifications. Well, that means if we have a look at code sharing, suppose that you start, or based on a certain image, uh, more containers in your host, then still we will have code sharing uh, if you use the same image. Yeah, if the executable file is in an image and you run multiple containers with that image, we still have code sharing. Yeah. But suppose that inside the container you dynamically build your executable, then the executable will be in this top layer 
And if you will run it later on in your container, then it will not be shared with other containers, even if these other containers are based on the same image. Yeah, so um, code sharing is, is in that sense, uh, it's, it's different from uh, normal code sharing if all the processes run with the host file system. Furthermore, if we have a look at Docker and Potman specifically, uh, with the command docker run and potman run, you can give various parameters. And they also relate to the memory management uh, uh, topics that I covered. Um, at the moment that you start a container with docker run, uh, each container will be a new C group underneath the directory sysfsc group machine slice or sysfsc group user slice. And particularly if you look at Potman and you run a container as a normal user, then you will get your uh, C group underneath your own user slice, yeah, with your own user ID. Um, usually if you use Docker or run Potman as root, then you will get your new C group underneath machine slice. However, in all cases, you can specify with docker run or potman run the parameter minus minus memory reservation yeah. is, for instance, 150 megabytes. Well, what will be done is that in this new C group for your container, uh, memory.low will be set. Yeah, and that will uh, give you a certain guarantee for the application in the container or the applications in the container, a guarantee of memory to be used. Yeah, that won't be touched and won't be swapped out. There's another parameter that you can use, which is minus minus memory, and that is putting a limitation, yeah, a max. And if I put 300M there, then that will be in the C groups memory.max that we have uh, seen earlier. Furthermore, you can also use the parameter minus minus memory dash swap, uh, which you can set, for instance, to 500M. And this is the memory and the swap yeah, together that can be used by the application in the container. So what really will be done is that memory.swap.max will be set to the, not to this value, memory.swap, but to this value minus this value. Yeah, so in this case, memory, uh, memory is 300 and memory swap is 500. It means that I have a, a limitation of 300 megabytes in memory and 200 megabytes on swap. If you uh, don't use memory dash swap as a parameter, but you use memory, uh, then the default is of memory swap is twice the parameter that you specified for memory. I will give you a small demo about that. Um, what I can do is run the command potman run. Minus minus memory is 50 megabytes. And I use an uh, image here, atcomp per float, in which I have the use mem command. Yeah, so I run the use mem command in a container. And the overruling command is use mem. Um, yeah, st allocate 20 megabytes and already uh, also uh, create it physically and repeat that every two seconds. Yeah, so it's increasing all the time. Uh, and the maximum is 50 megabytes of memory, but that Im also implies 50 meg megabytes in swap maximum. Yeah, and if both are filled, my process will be unkilled. So if I run this command, then it will do a number of allocations of 20 megabytes until the fifth one. Yeah, then memory is reaching its limit and swap is reaching its limit. So then it will be uh, ohm killed. Well, furthermore, you can also specify with Docker run and Potman run, you can specify ohm score adjustment. And, well, that's obvious, we talked about that. Uh, you can uh, make your process yeah, more sensitive for being killed by uh, ohm killing or uh, less sensitive by that. There are other parameters that are not supported anymore in C groups uh, version two. Uh, memory swappiness and uh, ohm kill disable, that's just for systems with C groups version one that can use that. 
Finally, I want to have a look at Kubernetes. At the moment that you um, create a new pod, the pod scheduler is going to search for a suitable worker node. Yeah? And one of the, um, one of the decisions uh, is based on what are the resource definitions of this pod. And what you can see in this pod's um, uh, manifest file that I have here on the slide is that I have a pod with two containers and that you can specify on container level resources. And there again you can specify limits and you can specify the limits for memory and CPU and you can specify requests which is in fact, uh, well, the, 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 the guarantee. Uh, and there I can also ask for a certain amount of memory. And you can see that uh, you can do that uh, differently per container. Well, at the moment that your pod is placed on a worker node, then it will also get a quality of uh, service, uh, which is defined by the pod scheduler. And that can be guaranteed, and that will be guaranteed when each container in this pod uh, has a specification of the resources, the limits, and the requests, and these specifications are equal. Yeah, as you can see here, uh, here the limits and the requests are equal, and for that other container, the limits and the requests are equal uh, as well. If that condition is met, then your pod will be scheduled as a guaranteed quality of service. And we will see what it uh, uh, means later on. But your, the quality of service of the pod can also be burstable, and that is as if you specify for one of the containers at least a memory or CPU limit, but which is not necessarily uh, the same. Yeah, the limits are, uh, and the requests are not the same values. Uh, or you didn't specify these values for all the containers in your pod, then you will get burstable as quality of service. If you didn't specify anything about resources at all in your pod, then you will get quality of service best effort. Well, depending on that quality of service, on the worker node where your pod will be scheduled, uh, you will be uh, scheduled in one of the C group subdirectories of that worker node. Yeah? And there's a special C group for QPods burstable and QPods uh, best effort, and there's a special C group for guaranteed quality of service. Well, on the worker node, if the pod is started, uh, then all these resource definitions are passed to the container runtime, like uh, container D, and then container D on that worker node will create a subdirectory, a C group for the pod as a whole, and underneath subdirectories per container. Yeah, and there it will again specify these limits and requests. Well, the resources.limits.memory yeah, that we uh, uh, see here, uh, limits memory, here the 200 megabytes for instance, uh, that will be used again as the memory max in the C group. Yeah. Um, are you going to exceed this later on? Then you will get own killing, yeah? because if you try to exceed your limit, then swapping has to be done, but usually worker nodes don't have swap. And therefore, if the application exceeds the limit, you immediately get the own killing of the process in your uh, container. If we look at the request value, uh, then you would maybe expect that the low value in the C group definition will be set by that, but that will not be done because that's also a problem. Suppose that your application that you set uh, a request value of 500 megabytes, your application is running and is going to exceed the 500 megabytes. At a certain moment, it becomes very crowded in memory, also by other containers and other processes. Then you have to be uh, pushed back to your limit, to your uh, uh, guarantee. And uh, at that moment, swapping should be done. But if your worker node doesn't have swap device, uh, you, you can't uh, get a, a process back uh, to its guaranteed value again. So what we see with resources request.memory 
is that it might change the Ohm's course value yeah, of the process. Uh, and for guaranteed qualities of service, then the Ohm's score will be set to a um, very low value, a negative value 997, which makes such a process almost, well, protected against Ohm killing. Uh, but burstable processes, they will get an ohm, ohm score adjustment value, again, that is uh, uh, calculated by a certain formula. Um, this, again, is the per mil value of this application inside the, the container on the worker node. Yeah. And if we have a, a real example about that, um, suppose that I have a burstable quality of service for my pot. Uh, if I have a do, look at kubectl describe of a node, yeah, my, my worker one node, I can see this is the total memory of my node, yeah, about 15 megabytes. If I go to that node, yeah, I'm here on work one, uh, then I can have a look at my process running in a container here, uh, and that process runs with the PID 8224 in this example, then I can see an Ohm score adjustment of 863. Uh, which, which is a high value, yeah, a high value which makes this process very uh, uh, sensitive of being killed by own killing. And you can see, according to this formula, this is 1,000 minus 1,000 times 200, because that's, in this example, what I specified for the request, um, divided by the size of the total memory of the worker node. Yeah. And that comes to this value, which is, uh, well, uh, giving this value a very high ohm score and making this process rather uh, sensitive for being killed by ohm killing, yeah? in contradiction to guaranteed, which has a very low value. Uh, best effort, yeah, so if you do not specify anything about requests and limits, uh, then the ohm score adjustment will always be 1,000, making this process even more uh, sensitive for own killing. By the way, um, that quality of service, you can see that if you do a kubectl describe of your pot, yeah, then you can see what uh, quality of service has been assigned to the pot based on what you specified for resource consumption. Finally, um, suppose that uh, you run uh, pots and they are running with this uh, best effort, then they are, uh, well, rather sensitive for own killing. Um, burstable quality of service is also sensitive of own killing, specifically if you combine it with a lot of natively running processes on the worker node, yeah, which are not started by Kubernetes, but just native demons that are running on the worker node itself. Uh, that makes also, uh, can, can introduce out of memory killing for containerized processes. Um, if you make your resources limits dot memory too tight, even with a quality of service guaranteed, it might be that your processes get own killed. Uh, and that's, for instance, if we look at this example here of this pod. Uh, in this pod, I use my atcomp perf load image again. I run the command use mem and allocate 20 megabytes all the time with a repetition of every five seconds. <clears throat> and you can see here that I have specified limits and requests with the same values. So this is quality of service guaranteed, uh, but still then, at a certain moment, uh, yeah, uh, doing a number of times that 20 megabytes allocation, I will reach my limit of 50 megabytes. And if I run this pod and I do a kubectl get, then I can see the modification of my status all the time, and I can see after creating this container and running it, it will be ohm killed after, well, uh, two or three times five seconds. And then it will be restarted by Kubernetes and it will be ohm killed it again and well end in a crash loop back off. Yeah, so if even if you are using uh, guaranteed quality of service, um, yeah, be, take care that you know what the need, the memory need of your application in the container is. 
Yeah, and you can, of course, find out by just running your application and then having a look at, for instance, with ATOP at the, the resident set size or with TOP and see how much space uh, and how much pages have been uh, paged in for your process. All right. Um, it's time, but still there might be some questions. Otherwise, yes. Sorry, which file system? The C group file system? Ah, okay. Um, you mean uh, the question is if I go to a sys fs c group that I have to be root to do modifications there? No, 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 normally not. No, it's... Okay, we can have a look uh, uh, afterwards, if you like. We can have a look uh, just uh, uh, afterwards, yeah. Okay, I want to close down. Uh, thanks for listening and uh, have a good day. <laughs> <laughs>